Jazz, it's absolutely wonderful to see you. You're looking absolutely glorious in green. <laughs> Anybody listening on the podcast, you've got to go and look at the video because it's a, just a stunning colour. Jazz, before we start, um, in case anybody out there doesn't know who you are and what you do, would you give us a little introduction? I'm sure there are some. Yeah, I'm I'm a keynote speaker, which I still feel is not a job, but I internationally speak around the world to audiences on things like I change people's minds about themselves, I think. So it's on things like resilience, mindset, radical well-being, human first leadership, the stuff that people would have described previously as soft skills, but are actually life skills. And if you want to lead a team, lead a family, connect, promote yourself. These are the things that you need to be doing because they garner loyalty. They pay into people's emotional bank account. And I'm passionate about that because I should be dead and I'm not. And it's because people have done this for me. So I've got a great X Factor backstory of coming up through foster care and living on the streets. Um, And then I became a teacher myself, started working with literacy because like reading writing and spelling were my tickets are mindset poverty never mind physical poverty it was the mindset that I had that held me back Uh, and then I started talking about growth mindset with teachers and leaders and then I did a TEDx talk and the rest is history (laughs) so yeah that's kind of my journey I I have a half part-time job dog I we foster a medical detection dog so he's only with me sort of the time so part-time dog and a full-time husband and three full-time children and that's what I do (laughs) <laughs> fantastic I, I quite like the idea of a part-time dog oh actually. it's fabulous it's, they pay yeah. the tax bills and everything they just I just get the lovely stuff and the nice photos and they do all the hard work oh oh I'm gonna look at that up thank you very much <laughs> um I also love that term that mindset poverty yes, I'm not sure yeah. I've ever heard it said in that way but it, <laughs> it really it strikes a chord of so many people that I meet that have got that that mindset of poverty mm. um and you have to break away from that and and so you you've been very lucky as you said you've met some amazing people that have helped you along that journey and I was going to ask you about your background but you beautifully and eloquently told us that's fabulous but how did you get started as a speaker though um I like the sound of my own voice (laughs) it's not that no I I um always had a very strong sense of injustice you know I was I was neglected and abused by my own mother and stepfather We, we were living in squats we were I was kept out of school I was forced to look after my younger brothers and sisters so I felt a very strong sense of this I'm sure this isn't meant to be how it is I was, uh, all my family are white apart from me. So there's a lot of racial abuse as well. And and I'm like, this can't be right. It can't be right. And I got a different story in school. In school, it was about being valuable and worth it. So I developed this kind of, well, two me's really. One that was the disconnected one in education that I wanted to be. And one that was the one at home that I didn't want to be. But I knew in order to survive, I had to turn the volume down on myself and stay quiet because that is what kept me alive and stopped me from getting beaten and kicked out. Once I ran away and left home and lived on the streets at 11 and then went into foster care and ran away again and then was homeless. Once I started doing that, I found my own voice and I started to become, I call it being 10% braver. The whole thing around mindset, poverty, 10%, these are all jazzisms that I'm trying to describe the journey to connect with people on it already. And then I, I... it it really was through literacy because I saw that reading, writing and spelling, I knew they were the things that changed me from broken to, you know, Beyonce, well, pound shop version. I knew they were were the things that made a difference because I was able to formulate my questions and ask them. Don't have any answers, but I have a bag full of questions and they're really good ones. So I started to ask questions when I was a teacher, like why are we do this strategy doesn't work? Why are we doing spelling like this? They're not, they're not owning it. They're just memorizing it and then forgetting it a week later. And people start to ask me, well, what do you think about that? Not my own school. They were like, shut up, Jazz. But other schools would ask me to come and speak for them. And then I started speaking more about literacy. And I actually worked with the government, governments around the world, um, helping them change their strategy. So I became kind of a bit of a di- big deal <laughs> in education. And then I started talking about the mindset piece around growth mindset. And I was asked to speak with leaders and CEOs in education, in health, in social care around that. And it, it kind of flinched when I did my TEDx talk and I I I sort of saw myself as a speaker because prior to that I felt I was just dissatisfied with people settling and trying to encourage them to see more of what was possible how much agency they had but when I did my TEDx talk that's when I'm like oh my god no I do this this is this is people are actually taking agency from what I'm saying this is what I want to do so 
it, it really, honestly, all my speaking is from a dissatisfaction of seeing other people stay in toxic relationships, work in situations where they're not able to show their best. I, I am dissatisfied. I want to leave the planet better than I found it, not as I'd expect to find it. And that means I've got to inconvenience myself. So speaking for me is a way of inconveniencing myself and, and doing my best to pay forward the people who stood by me. That's amazing. It's wonderful. I love that you have jazzisms, which is really great. <laughs> uh, I think that's really cool. Term. That's not mine. People are like, do you have a jazz dictionary? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you should. You should have a jazz dictionary. I and I, I also love that you describe yourself as pound shop Beyonce. Come which on. Just... That's what. <laughs> you do not, do not turn on the screen and think, is that Beyonce? Oh my gosh, I thought it was. <laughs> it <just laughs> I, on my student union card, I used to have a picture of Naomi Campbell because I was conf I was the only brown person at uni and I was confused for every other brown person passing by. So I thought I might as well be a famous supermodel. So I'm, I'm still living the dream. I'm making out that I am the spit of Beyonce, which oh, I know is not so, true. That is so cool that head. you had Naomi Campbell on your... Oh, that is so <laughs> never cool, got stopped. so cool. Never got stopped. Yeah. <laughs> and I love two, two things also that I love. The fact that you say the importance of literacy, the importance mm. of reading, writing, spelling. And yeah. I think... In this day of AIs where somebody else can do your reading, writing and, and, and all that for you, I think it's dangerous for us not to keep learning and keep, you know, improving our own skills. Yeah. And I also love the fact that you said that you asked really good questions. I think too often if you ask the wrong question, you're not going to get a really great answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think we're taught to write, ask really good questions. No. No, you're right, actually. We, if you look at the education system, it's very much about conforming. You know, yeah. the, the whole Victorian model was let's train these kids to be great factory workers. And we really haven't broken away from that very much. So there's this whole thing of be creative, have ideas. But actually, if you don't get this level of marks, you are deemed not good enough. And these people are deemed good enough. So our value is connected not in who we are with people, but in what we can do. And that means asking questions is dangerous because it means that you might have to change your identity. You might have to think a certain way. And it's it, like our amygdala is like, just, you know, just do what you can, get through the day, stay safe. So our brain is programmed to keep us alive and asking questions feels like a risk. It's got the risk of failure attached to it as well. Whereas my feeling is we should be aiming for epic failure. So questions are great for me because that will get me to wrong quicker so I can move past wrong and get to right. So Fantastic. I think yeah. that that's... It, it, it's interesting because the same skills of being an entrepreneur, a keynote speaker and being on the streets as a teenager, they're the same set of skills and it, it, the same set of surviving to thriving to driving change to being truly alive. It's the same set of skills. So I, I think I'm applying what I've learned to what I what I do now, really. And I think that's what we all do. We we, we apply everything that we've gathered and that we've accumulated mm. in all of our experiences. And that the, the, the struggle is to find out where do we apply it to? It sounds like you've yeah. found exactly where to apply it to and where do we focus to? Because often we go in the wrong direction and we're not using our strengths. We're not using our skills. We're not using our experiences. So it's wonderful that you've found that route. So, so give me a description of what your speaking business consists of. So you told us that you speak, but you have mm. other parts to the business. What else do you yeah, do? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not, I was speaking and that's great. And people say, you're so inspirational. And, and that's lovely. But my answer is always great. What have I inspired you to do? Because if you haven't, if you don't do anything, I've just piqued your interest. I'm not interested in inspiring anyone. And I, I can inspire you without getting out of bed. I've got dressed and come to somewhere. I want to do more, want more return on my investment. So my whole thing is like, what's going to change? What are you going to do more of, less of? How are you going to be 10% braver than you were yesterday? And, and that is the stuff when people, all my evaluations, when they when they message me, when they write to me, they are the things I'm like, this is why I do this. So to that end, what I did, especially in education, as I was moving out and doing more when I made the shift to corporate and, and business, I wanted to kind of have, what's the best I can do for you? So I broke down all of the things I spoke about, imposter syndrome, kicking imposter syndrome to the curb, well-being for idiots, myself included, because if it was accessibility, we'd all be well. There's plenty of videos. It's the mindset again. Um, human first leadership, how to connect, engage, communicate, that whole mindset around resilience, not being putting up with stuff, but shortening the time between being on the floor and bouncing back. Autonomy, agency, audience engagement, all of that sort of stuff around story. And so I put it all into six 10 six minute toolkits that each one is six videos and each video is 10 minutes long. And then there's a play sheet because we don't work, we play. So there's a play sheet that goes with it. And I thought, right, th I'll give you this. And then you guys can, but what happened is people were binge watching it like Netflix rather than watching it every week. 
asking for more. So I produced more toolkits, added more to that, and it's grown into kind of real sort of training and coaching area. It's like Netflix for the soul. That's what it is. <laughs> so, so it's, I have, I leave people with that. I gift people access to that and I leave them with that as well when I've gone. And that's something that individuals can actually take agency, take autonomy for and move forward with. I also do like um, uh, videos and virtual uh, content. So I do virtual keynotes, I've got my home pandemic proof home studio here that I do my virtual keynotes from and pre-recorded videos on topics that people ask for. Then I've got a coaching side to my business. So my co-founder, Ed, um, runs the coaching side and that's one-to-one -one coaching and also kind of life realignment, which is a real in-depth <laughs> session, which I've gone through and is massively eye-opening. Um, and we do workshops. So we go to away days and retreats and do workshops on leadership, usually um, around ways of hearing your getting your voice known. We also talk to we do a lot on bias, which I call belonging. Diversity and inclusion is called belonging. So I do a lot of workshops on that. And I'm an advisor on a couple of boards um, and a trustee on a couple of boards around how you can meet people where you are, where they are and be human first. So it's quite wide ranging. Education is where my heart is. But education doesn't stop when you leave school. You don't, you don't die at 16 when you get your GCSE results and go, oh, that's it, life over. Education is lifelong. So all through um, work and the world of work, that's where I do a lot of my work with leaders, with um, human resources a lot of the time, with marketing is another big one. Retail is huge. But in places where teams are. So everybody gets the opportunity to do everything. And usually it's an in-person gig, followed by coaching, followed by the Human First Academy or my training Netflix for the soul, followed by some workshops. But for us, it's really like I'm more than a keynote. I'm not in like even when I'm just speaking, I'm not going to show up, speak, and leave. I want to be there, get temperature of the room, talk to people, stay afterwards, engage with people, give, add value, bring joy, give what I am and what I can. Because I'm my, I want my world changed. And I can't do it by just turning up, speaking, leaving. I want, I want the world changed. I need other people enrolled in that. So it's a kind of full service thing, but it has grown out of people saying, and you come back and speak again. And I'm like, what? I can't keep going into every trust, every school, every social service, every council. It, there's got to be more. It's not, it's, I'm not magic. The resources and what you do, that's the magic. So it's a way of trying to get other people engaged. And I really want to put myself out of business. Like you don't need me because you, you are empowered yourself. That's the goal. That's, that's wonderful. It's really wonderful. What I love is the fact that you're reacting to what people are saying. I what we want mm, more yeah. of this, um, and and you, so you're being led very much by what the needs are, as yeah, opposed to what yeah. you think it is. You're really you're really understanding your 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 audience and your target. You've actually missed an area of your company oh. of your business. Yeah, you have. You have products as well, and I I, I, I feel very bad that I haven't got my mug I, with me I, because I you, you gifted me a beautiful mug which said which says together we can change or, or the work we do changes the world. We, and you've we got are, you've got our work bracelets. Changes life. That's I it. do, I'll and I have, I have this on this one. I got dressed up especially for you. Had my secretly awesome top on. Yeah, and you've got these t-shirts, wonderful yeah. jewelry with with uh, with yeah. Slow, yeah. yeah. Um, the one I true. wanted was out of stock. I'm gonna have to check and see oh. if it's back in stock. So I wanted a, I wanted one of those bracelets. Um, yeah. No, and so uh, what I love is that these some of these products and services that you have. Let's call them all products for the yeah. moment. Um, you don't need to be there, like you said. You don't need to be there. Mm. People can buy those things. As gifts for each other yeah. and remind themselves yeah. every day that they're awesome they can they've got the the videos which they can carry on and they can use without you necessarily being there they've got the play sheet rather than the worksheet I like that um, <laughs> um so that they can so it's it's great that there are areas where they can work without you because as you said you are one person yeah. uh, and, and it sounds like you want to make yourself redundant as soon as possible <laughs> Which is a great, you know, objective to have in life, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, that's that's really cool. Um, and, and actually, so you've mentioned that you've mentioned Ed. So you're not a solopreneur, then? It sounds like you have some support. Tell us no, about your support. I mean, I have been a solopreneur for years, and I always thought I wasn't designed to work for people because I seem to cause so much trouble with my incessant questioning. So. Uh, and at first I thought, well, I need to be a leader. And it was, and I remember when I first started teaching, looking at the leaders and they're all white and male and middle class. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm not allowed to do that because I'm none of those things. So I can't do that. And it was this idea of like, I'm not allowed. Now, where did that come from? No one said you can't do this, but I couldn't see anyone like me. So I assumed I couldn't do it. 
So there was this constant frustration with, I knew I was destined to create something and to bring other people on board and to take some people who you know didn't have skills and train them up so they did and they can go off and do great things. But I don't want to be some you know megalomaniac running an, an organization. And really that's how the t-shirts came about, the t-shirts of truth. People saying, oh, you say this. And when lockdown hit, I started doing all virtual. So I just got my jazzisms printed on t-shirts. People were saying, can I have that? Can I have that? So I'm like, yeah, sure, I'm giving it away. But I was printing the t-shirts myself. And I'm like, I can't, I have two jobs, right? This is the things I'm best at. My two jobs are I create content and I show up and shine. And that's all I do. If there is any other job that needs doing, someone else is going to have to do it. And that's how I built a team, by <laughs> finding people who would do the stuff that I could do. But why would I do that when it's not, yeah, I can do bookkeeping, but why would it's, it's energy and time. I want to do the things, create content, show up and shine. So I started looking for people straight away. And, and I looked for people who, like me, were solopreneurs, who I could collaborate with and I could, you know, bring together and work with. And that, that has worked great. And we have, I have, you know, a team now of people around me, most of whom are contractors. So people I bring in to do stuff, but have been with me for five, 10 years and, and work for me. So we have these great relationships. We have, we don't have team meetings. We have the human first family party. <laughs> And we don't have apologies. We have, I've got a life, so I'm not here. So it, we've crafted this kind of way of being. What we encourage other teams to do, we actually live it ourselves. And the team is quite transient. And the, the thing I say when I take anyone on is at some point, I'm going to fire you or you are going to leave. Let's let's agree now how we're going to negotiate and manage that so that at the end, if things are going to end, I want them to end well. So, you know, you'll grow apart from me. I'll grow apart from you. We'll have different needs. That's going to be OK. Let's decide that now so we don't have to keep going through this drama every time, because that's something I really I want people to have a good experience. I want to be fulfilling their dreams as well as them helping me fulfilling mine. So it's, it's there's an audition to join out. <laughs> there really is. And and it's I am dependent on the work that other people do. I, I you know, you've taught me so much. I, I, I wouldn't be here without the advice you've given me. I wouldn't be here without people helping me with different things. And there's, there's stuff around content is me I all my social media is me I write that you know I record the videos in one take that's me I have people editing them editing the videos for me I don't do anything technical like that but I, I like it, authenticity is important to me so I wouldn't have someone writing posts for me and putting them out for me because it can work for others that's not my style but I have someone doing everything else literally my CRM somebody runs that but I have people working I have a stylist I have, I have a driver I have everything I don't do anything else unless it's my unique skill. And that has been the number one thing that has helped me grow massively by narrowing down. You know, you've got to kind of niche down to like, what is it that I do brilliantly and then push ahead and do that. That's such brilliant advice. That mm -hmm. is such brilliant advice to really focus on what your strengths are, niche down and get on with it. And I love the fact that you say that you create content and show up and shine. That's, That's what it. you do. That's your job. <laughs> so when you said initially, I'm a keynote speaker. No, you're not. I'm a content creator who shows up and shows up, shows that, up and shines. I can't I like say that. it. <laughs> I like that. I'm getting out on a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I guess. That's my um, job. And I love the fact you have a prenup with your employees. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's let's agree. <laughs> first, employ someone. They they like they become family. They're friends, and it, and I don't want to let them go. And the first person I employed just to be my PA, she worked in my sort of garage office, and I had a baby during that time. I I do that a lot. I've got three, but I had a baby during that time, and and it was I knew I wasn't going to be able to carry on. And she actually came to me and said, "Jazz, you need to downsize, and you need to let me go because the, you're not running a business. This is an expensive hobby." And, and I would I would have carried on with her because I didn't want to upset her. And I'm like, no, this doesn't work. It doesn't work for her and it doesn't work for me. So let's find a way of of moving through the natural stages of working with people. You know, it's it's no one's ever fired me yet. No one's ever said to me, I don't want to work with you anymore. But, but when it does end, it ends well so that people can go on and do something else greater. You know, it's very insightful. It's very interesting. I, I, I've never heard anybody speaking that way about that. I think that's a really interesting thought. Um, I, I like that. I'm going to, going to remember that one. Um, <laughs> so you've talked about you've worked in education, you've worked in business. Um, they're very different, um, although yeah. you've said it's that education piece that that transcends the lot. Mm. You know, that's the sort of the through feeling, if you like, the through thought that goes through everything that you do is about education, continually educating yeah. and learning. What's the difference between working with education audiences and working with business audiences? 
I, I thought it was a huge difference. And I remember thinking to myself, I mean, we talked about this before. I'm an education speaker. I can't possibly. And then I only ever, I've never advertised. So it, and I have a big word of mouth. I've been doing this for a while. People, all my gigs, I get inquiries all the time, every day. And they're all coming from people who've seen my TEDx talk or heard me speak or someone else has heard me speak. So I, as I was being asked to do stuff outside of education, and the first one was in America, I was flown to California to speak to creative entrepreneurs. And I remember getting there and thinking, oh, dang, I can't do this. What, what do I know? I'm a street kid from Nottingham with a teaching degree. I've got nothing to say. What is a creative entrepreneur? I'm, I'm like spiraling. And I, so I went to the guy who organized it and said, I can't do this. You got somewhere else. This was like 14 years ago, my, my younger days. And he said, um, oh, you've got imposter syndrome. And I remember saying to him, it's not a syndrome if you are an imposter, right? I, it's just fact. And he's like, imposter syndrome. And I remember thinking, maybe I need to see what he sees in me and hold that as fact and not go with my own feeling. Sometimes you've got to choose fact over feeling. So so I, I held that as like, if I have something of value and he believes I have, let me say that. And it went down a storm. And what I realized is that the problem was me. The barrier was me. It wasn't the audience. I need to meet people where they are. And that's what I'm great at. On my website, it says, I make people laugh, cry, leave on a high. And that is not from my end, that's from their end. So as long as I'm showing up and meeting people where they are, there really is no difference. That the it's it, it, Mary has said this all the time. I know you said this, it's got to be relevant. So my biggest thing is do a great scoping call. What do you need? What are the fears? What are the challenges? What are the stories they're telling themselves? Often the leader will tell me something different to the people. So I want to get all of that information. What do I need? What What are you afraid of coming up? What? And then when I turn up. I do the showing up and shining, but it's with a keynote that is drawn and crafted to the needs of that audience. So I want to know, what do you want people to say, do, think and feel at the end? And I will craft something that guarantees that. And I found, actually, if anything, business is, is easier than education because they have a lot of structure around what they have to do, whereas business are agile in a way because they're looking at how do we serve? As a, and how do we make profit and how do we increase productivity as opposed to there is no reward we just got to do our job or Ofsted will rip us a new one so they operate under a slightly more freeing way of being less scarcity but then there are these fantastic challenges that come along like the great resignation and and, and well-being that's realistic and how do we lead in the digital age and it, it, and these are the questions that I love these huge what are the unwritten rules of work I, I, I love these questions so I talk about them I, I show up for people I answer them and then we craft things into a keynote that will cause the change that people want to see so I I, I think the, the difference was me more than the actual industry it's about the audience you know some people say when you're speaking imagine them naked why would you want to do that it's scary enough as it is I used to feel sick before I went on stage but what I do now is instead of thinking what if I get it wrong what if I say something wrong what if I, they laugh what if they don't laugh I think what if these people who've shown up put their kids in childcare, taken time off doing their emails shown up in the hope that I give them one thing. What if they take that one thing and it galvanizes them into action to cause positive change that ripples throughout their legacy? That, And then I don't worry about me. I don't feel worried because they're all about me getting it wrong. What I'm concerned about is what are people taking away and what are they doing? And my focus is on that the whole time. So I, you know, I've spoken to a wide range of audiences, engineering, you know, retail, Gucci, who liked my t-shirts. I'm taking that as a fashion designer, little A in there. But, uh, and, and it, it's it's the same because I'm speaking to humans. They're human first, marketeer second, human first, CEO second, human first, educator second. So that's where I meet them. Fantastic. Fantastic. I love that saying that you said, um, it's not a syndrome if you are an imposter. <laughs> it's just such a, so funny. It's absolutely <laughs> genius. You look at me like, come on, Jess. <laughs> But it's interesting because I think you probably got sort of your confidence shaken because you're thinking, well, these guys yeah. are, are all experts in this, this and this. And actually, they hadn't brought you in to be an expert in no. their topic. No. They brought you in to be an expert in your topic. And that's mm -hmm. sometimes why we have this imposter syndrome or this lack of yeah. confidence, because we're thinking, but you guys know so much about I don't know anything about your yeah. industry, but actually they want to know what you know and how they can apply yes. it. And more yes. often than not, they don't actually want you to make the link or the association. They'll do that themselves. They That's just want true. to know, give me the knowledge. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes speakers try too hard to make the link. Uh, the yeah. questions you yeah. ask, the scoping is so important. So I'm glad yeah. you referenced that, that really understanding what is it that uh, what you say, say, think, uh, feel and do. Say, Brilliant. think, feel and do. Yeah, yeah. 
Brilliant, brilliant. But also the fears, the, what you have to avoid, the risks, yeah. what's going on. Yeah. And so, so true that often the person bringing you in is going to give you a different objective <laughs> and view than the person who's going to be sitting in the audience. It's so important yeah. to get a real sort of 360 view of what what's going on in that organisation and not just be briefed by one person, ideally, you know, mm -hmm. take a bit of time yeah. to talk to more. So, yeah, very good. Love that. Love that. Um. Listen, I could talk to you all day, but I want to talk to you about something that happened last year, which I think probably had a huge effect yeah. on your business. You you won a couple of speaker awards, didn't you? So it's, tell I me did. about that and how that's <laughs> impacted you. Yeah, I mean, I I like so the speaker awards are very prestigious, and you kind of think, you know, I haven't got a chance. There's no way I'm gonna. But what a great experience to go and be part of that and meet people in your community, and that is the reason why everyone should apply and go and get nominated. I went along thinking, you know, if I if I can get my name mentioned in the highly commended runner up category, oh, I, that's that's me done. That's like tick box. And I did get highly commended for best virtual gig, which I thought was. A, and I remember coming to sit down with my certificate and saying to my operations manager, does this count as an award? Because I want to be like Jazz and Puff our award winning speaker. She's like, yeah, I think so. Then they announced the winner of the best um, in person gig. And this is like this is the Oscars. This is best actor. Right. This is the top thing. And. Uh, they didn't call my name for highly commended and I was like oh but it's okay because next year I know what to do come back bigger stronger and then they called my name as winning it and uh I mean that was mind-blowing that was mind-blowing it was a massive honor and that because I knew the caliber of speaker there so I collected my award and I'm or it was on my birthday as well so all my friends were there so I collected the award everyone's cheering it's great I came sat down I'm sort of crying I'm snot all and then I sit down and people are going oh well done I'm like oh thanks and then they announced speaker of the year this is like, if, 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 if best live gig is actors, this is like best film, best everything. This is La La Land, this is whatever. So, or they didn't win, did they? <laughs> I don't remember, I'm not sure. No, no, they announced it and it wasn't them. I don't know what happened. Anyway, sorry, Harrison Ford, to bring back that trauma. Uh, and if, I, they announced people of the year and they said my name. And there's a beautiful photo, I will send it to you so you can use in this. It's the least flattering photo of me ever. And in this photo, it's the moment where everyone realizes I've won speaker of the year apart from me. And you can see my daughter like screaming and my ops manager cheering. And I'm literally sat with this look of shock on my face. And I know exactly what I was thinking. It's impossible. How do you go from foster care to speaker of the year? That's not possible. And yet here I am and it's happened. And if that is possible, and it is, then what's possible for everyone else? What else can we do? And, and what, what are we thinking is impossible that might not be? And it was just this massive moment of redemption for everyone who believed in me. And I remember um, Elliot, the host, came up to me and said, so, Jazz, I bet your fees are going up now. <laughs> and I'm already expensive. Like, I'm expensive, you know, reassuringly so. I'm either free or expensive, nothing in between. And, I, you know, other sausages are available if you can't afford me. But I I, I do something very specific. And uh, and I thought, oh, yeah, you know what? My price is still going up. And literally what has happened from that, and I, I think this is partly mindset, it's partly me. And it's partly the content I create around what I do and what I'm sh how I'm showing up for people and, and asking the questions. I, I have, my bookings have gone through the roof. My inquiries have gone through the roof. I was really focusing on um, doing more corporate so I can create a speaker bureau for education of people with care experience. I'm doing less in education. And every corporate gig I do, I gift a gig to education. So people are growing future heroes. But it was, I was finding it hard to, like what sort of corporate area do I want to be in? Where do I want to speak at? And I'm also an established speaker, so I don't want to turn up and do stuff for free because that's that kind of devalues my brand. Um, so suddenly I'm getting people are seeing a photo of me winning the award and saying, Oh, you're speaker of the year. Can you can you can we speak to you about speaking at our conference? Um, people are seeing content that I've done, encouraging other people to apply. And none of it is, hey, look at me, I want speaker of the year. All of it is I did not think this was possible. I've had to check update my story about myself. So what's your story and how are you updating it? And since then, I, I've done ITV, Unum, Biogen, <laughs> Circle PR. I'm going to Tropic Skincare on Saturday. I mean, my my corporate gigs have increased by 13, we worked it out at, since winning that award. And it's been a matter of months. So everything has changed and I have had to update my story to agree with that. So when people say, oh, you're phenomenal, and most people go, oh, oh no, you, you have to look them in the eye, smile and say, thank you. <laughs> Because the evidence that other people are giving you kind of leads into that. And it's it's hard because I kind of feel like Speaker of the Year is, it, it, I, my, my initial thing is how do I help other people get here? How do I pay this back? How do I be an ambassador? Uh, a bit like Miss World. <laughs> how do I be an ambassador? 
and part of that was because I found it hard to take it on myself and it's like I can't it's too it's too amazing and good and it can't be me but I've had to update the way I describe myself to myself to be the same as the way other people describe me in order to stand on the truth about who I am so that award has changed everything not just for work but for me me as a human you know what's really lovely is because Mary and I are actually judges this year, but we weren't we weren't judges last year, which is great because of course we've worked with you, so we wouldn't yeah. have been able to judge you anyway. We have to if we've worked with anybody, we have to uh, re, re, is it recruit recruit? I never remember. The, I never remember. Hide you in a to, cupboard. Re, you have to hide in a cupboard. Have to, yeah, I never remember what the name the word is. Um, so we have to remove ourselves. And um, and what was wonderful was to see you, you win because I mean I saw the list of speakers and I thought hey, that jazz should be the winner, but I thought I can't say that because. I worked with her and I'd work with others too but yeah I know yeah. I know you and I know what you've I know how you have transitioned what you've done and that the fact that when you work with people what's interesting when you work with anyone to help you and guide you you take it all on board and you action it and that's another yes. difference I yeah. think about you um is that you go and do the work um you get it done yeah um, I do. So, yeah. yeah it takes a while sometimes but it's... well you're busy you're busy but you do it you do it <laughs> yeah. so let's end on something then about the future what's mm. next what's next for jazz i want my own netflix show that's what's next and when i say it people go oh my gosh i can see you doing that <laughs> <laughs> that's what's happening and actually even just putting that out there i i when i was speaking and working at um itv i i actually accidentally pitched my own tv show to and they're like yeah how do we take what you've done on stage and make that into a show so but that's the next thing because it's audience i i am I, my my partner ed does depth and one-to-one -one with people coaching i don't do depth i do breadth i am the, i'm the sizzle he's the sausage or i'm the why he's the how is probably more accurate but yeah so i don't know I, if you I, should call him a sausage but yes gee he's got content to him i'm like get you all like wow and then he does the hard work but for me it's about it's about audience it's about stage it's about how many people can i um persuade and invite to be the human they were designed to be instead of the human that the, the world, society has squashed them into feeling they've got to be. What's the biggest audience I can get for that? And it's not really about me being, I, I, I love being on big stages, I love being on small stages, but I am, I, I love, I love speaking, you know, I love connecting with people. I am a connector. So being able to do that, um, I did TV presenting before, I've done children's TV presenting, you know, I, I did modeling when I was younger. So I'm, I've been behind the camera a lot. And Part of me being behind the camera is, is knowing that I'm authentically connecting with one person, even though you're speaking to millions. And that's the most important thing. It's that how do we make that one connection where they go on to make a difference? I'm not going to walk with people the whole way. I have a team who do that, but I am going to get them to a point where they go, do you know what? Enough, enough. So the whole thing is, yeah, a Netflix show, or I don't mind which TV channel, actually. BBC can do it first. I don't mind. They're quite good. But it's the idea of having something that invites people into a space of change. So watch love. this space. Yeah, that's what happens next. <laughs> I cannot wait. I cannot wait. That'd be wonderful. I love that. Um, and actually, we ought to share how people can get in touch with you. So obviously, if they, anybody wants to book you to speak, let's let them go to a bureau of their choice where you yes. are probably listed because you work with several bureaus. So please yeah, book yeah. via bureaus. Uh, obviously I'm slightly biased in that regard. No, bureaus, Encourage sure, because they, they are great at handling bookings. So yeah, <laughs> definitely. That yeah. is the first place to go. Super. And then the second question is if somebody wants to connect with you directly, what's the best place to do that? I am all over social media. The, the advantage of being a said list reality TV star is you can put Jazz the Apprentice into Google and you'll find me. So I'm all over the main platforms, Jazz and Pal Far, that's A-M-P-A-W-F-A-R-R. -A -A um, th that's on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, all of them, Instagram, LinkedIn. I'm all over the place. I'm really easy to find. Um, and my TEDx talk also is on YouTube and on my website. So there's plenty of um, ways to get in touch with me. And know that I reach out to everybody personally who reaches out to me. So I, I really believe in that kind of human first connection. And I, I've got to say, Maria, this that you're seeing now, this jazz was a different jazz before we started working together, not just professionally, but personally. So I, I, I can't underestimate the amount of impact you've had on me. And the mark of a great leader is what happens when you're not in the room anymore. I hear your voice in my head all the time. So that is, it's getting that guidance in order to do the stuff you want to do is critically important. Thank you. That's wonderful to hear. And I'm so sorry you're hearing my voice in your head. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Jazz, thank you. You've been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Maria.